Good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Curry. I'm a journalist based in Berlin. I write a lot about history and science. And I did a story that came out in the February edition of National Geographic on alcohol and its influence on humanity, uh, both in really deep time and in the present. Um, I know we're at a beer and health symposium. This was just to make you make sure you were all awake. Uh, <laughs> we're here to talk about beer. Um, this story was extremely popular all around the world. I think people everywhere uh, are interested in alcohol. It's integral to culture, to how we understand ourselves, and Archaeologists and anthropologists, I think, are just starting to take it more seriously when they look at uh, evidence that they find in archaeological sites. One of the things I looked at was the chemical and other hard scientific evidence that people are finding that we've been drinking beer for a very, very long time. These are just some of the different um, National Geographic editions. So, we all know we like beer. We all know alcohol makes us feel good. Uh, I think there's a lot of evidence that it's also good for us. But the question is, why? Why is it good for people? Uh, and it's not a foregone conclusion. Not every animal enjoys alcohol. Not every animal seeks alcohol out. Humans are actually an exception. Um, and this goes back a very long way. Uh, Yeasts, which, as you probably know, are responsible for fermenting all kinds of alcohol, are some of the oldest microorganisms on Earth and are everywhere. We went to a brewery last night where yeasts uh, wild ferment um, beer right on the edge of Brussels. Yeasts have been doing this to fruit for a very long time. Why is this important? Um, there's a nutritional sweet spot. When the yeast invades the fruit, it, it gets inside, it starts fermenting the fruit. Uh, the fruit gets slightly alcoholic. Before it goes all the way to rotten, the yeast unlocks more calories inside the fruit. Animals that are eating fermented fruit are getting more nutritional benefit than animals that are eating ripe or unripe fruit. And a lot of fruit um, also smells. I mean, we all know from fermentation. You can smell fermenting fruit from further away. So there's been a discussion for a long time that maybe really deep in our past, we evolved, we, when I say we, I mean our, our distant ancestors, our um, monkey great, 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 great grandfathers, um, the ones that could sense and were especially attracted to fruit, fermenting fruit, uh, and the ones that had a craving for it, the ones that really wanted to stuff as much of that fermenting fruit in their mouth as possible, would have had an evolutionary advantage. They would have been able to get more calories from their environment than their, their fellows, and that would have passed down genes and adaptations that connect us to alcohol to later descendants. An evolutionary biologist named Robert Dudley at UC Berkeley put this book out in 2014. The, the title Drunken Monkey is a little bit of a, it's a little bit deceptive. If you're a monkey in the jungle, you don't actually want to be drunk. That would be really deadly. <laughs> uh, it would be a really easy way to end up in a, a leopard's mouth. Um, but his hypothesis was that our deep ancestors were attracted to alcohol and that this is something that's been biologically passed down to us today. He wrote this in 2014. In 2015, a group of scientists actually did the evolutionary math. They looked at the, if you look at the, the far right, those are our monkey cousins, and they worked backwards to look at common ancestors. And they found a mutation you can see the red at the bottom. They found a mutation that allows humans and a handful of other primates to process ethanol 
far more efficiently than all of our relatives, than basically the entire animal kingdom. If you look at the graph on the left, that red line is how fast we process ethanol, which is the key ingredient in alcohol. And the line on the bottom is everybody else. Um, we're really good at this, and we have been for 10 million years. Uh, so this would have encouraged for a very long time animals to, to go after these fruits. Not coincidentally, I talked to the, the biologists who put this together, not coincidentally, that 10 million year time point is right about the time that monkeys and apes were coming down out of the trees in these ancient forests and first starting to walk on the forest floor, first starting to look for food on the forest floor, which was a key development in much later us. We, you know, we walk and, and now talk today. Uh, so fast forward nine some million years. Humans have evolved into the, the best, not quite the only, but by far the best tool makers on earth. We've populated just about every environment. Alcohol probably remains a happy accident when we can find fermented fruit. Um, there's very little evidence before 10,000 years ago, hard archaeological evidence that we made alcohol. This site is on a hilltop in southeastern Turkey. It's about 15 kilometers from the Syrian border. It's called Gobekli Tepe. And Archaeologists there have found some of the oh, some of the earliest examples of ritual buildings, temples, uh, these huge structures, these T-shaped pillars in the middle that you see here are three meters tall. They're made of stone, and they were made by people who couldn't yet make pots. They were still hunter gatherers. They didn't have metal tools. They were using stone tools to build these tremendous religious sites. This took a huge amount of effort. This took a lot of manpower. And so the archaeologists started asking themselves, how do you get a lot of highly mobile hunter-gatherer small groups together in one place for a, a week, two, to donate their labor to build these temples? And they thought, maybe beer. Um, inside the, these temple enclosures, they found these round vessels. These can hold about 150 liters, 200 liters. Um, and on the inside of the vessels, they found oxalate, which is sometimes known as beer stone. And it's a byproduct of grains and some other uh, plants. And I think for brewers today, it's a problem, but for archaeologists, it's a gift because it shows you what people were doing inside these vessels. And so they can show they were definitely using grain for something inside these vessels. And it's not too far of a leap to say maybe they were brewing a very primitive type of beer. You can't prove it 100%. It could be 150 liter vats of oatmeal or porridge. I don't think that's so likely. But, and neither do the archaeologists. All of which is to say there's a lot of very strong circumstantial evidence that to attract people to, to donate this labor, they were brewing beer. Now, this was also before what's called the Neolithic Revolution, which is when people started domesticating crops for farming. But there's been a long standing question in archaeology about whether the first grain was domesticated for bread or for beer. And the idea that you would need beer on a regular basis, a predictable basis, to attract people to a central location is a really powerful one. And this is, this is another a closer view of one of these vessels. That's a, a wild donkey's shoulder bone that they use to scrape the inside of the vessel. Um, Bill Bakley Tapa's Right here. Uh, this is some of the earliest areas where they domesticated emmer, einkorn, 
and the red is barley, which we all know and love. Um, about 50 kilometers away from Gobekli Tepe is where they found the first evidence of domesticated grain. So this is a lot of very powerful circumstantial evidence that we settled down. We decided to stop living off the land and we, we settled down to farm in order to provide ourselves with a regular, steady supply of beer. Uh, now, as I said, this is inconclusive. Um, there's no way to say 100% that oxalate is strictly for beer production. The first solid evidence of alcohol is about 9,000 years ago, 7,000 BC in China. These vessels labeled A, they're making rice wine out of them. Um, they were flavoring it with all kinds of fruit. Uh, this was after the Neolithic Revolution. So people had already started domesticating crops. And one of the first things they did with the rice that they domesticated was make alcohol out of it. Um, you have to assume that this isn't isolated to China, that this is going on in a lot of different places at the same time. The trouble is proving it archaeologically. Um, you need chemical residues. You need the vessels themselves to have been preserved. If you were an ancient brewer using a wood tub, that wouldn't survive as evidence for us today. So the fact that the Chinese made wine in 7,000 does not necessarily mean that they, that's the first alcohol. This means that's the first alcohol that can be proven. And that evidence comes from an archeologist at the University of Pennsylvania named Patrick McGovern, who's really revolutionized the study of alcohol in the past by introducing chemical analysis and a lot of really specific scientific techniques to analyze these ancient vessels. That archaeologists in the past, I think, archaeologists have a reputation for maybe drinking a little too much in the field. Alcohol was a, it wasn't seen as a serious thing to study. And so you would find these tremendous vessels, you would find massive cauldrons, um, and it would sort of be in the side notes. You know, this, this was found in the burial. It was a drinking vessel, but what they were drinking in it and what role that played in society wasn't taken particularly seriously until fairly recently. And you could demonstrate with chemistry exactly what they were drinking. And McGovern's done some amazing stuff. You know, he can, he can tell that they were flavoring it with honey. He can look at what fruits they were using based on tiny little pollen residue that's preserved and stuck to the inside of these jars. Um, and that's provided a lot of evidence all the way up to the invention of writing. And it is also no coincidence that as soon as people could write, they started recording the things that were most important to them, like beer. This is a Mesopotamian beer ration. It's a record that workers were paid in beer from 5,100 years ago. Uh, the, the Mesopotamians were using beer to pay workers. It was an incredibly integral part of their life. There's dozens of different words for beer, different kinds of beer recorded. Um, and researchers are doing some really interesting stuff, combining the written records with archeological records. Uh, this is a site in Syria that was excavated, obviously before the civil war there. Um, they had dozens of houses that were burned. The, the village had a sudden fire, it was abandoned. And so it was, it sort of captured a moment in time. And if you look at the upper right-hand corner of this building, there's a, round, there's a circle. Uh, that's a, a big beer vessel. That each one of these houses had a 150 to 200 liter pot set into the floor, you couldn't move it, and covered in oxalate. Um, every house was brewing its own beer on a regular basis. It's right next to the oven. It's right next to the main entrance to the house. This was something 
everyone all the time, every day was extremely familiar with. Uh, and the archaeologist who excavated this pointed out that the Mesopotamians had a terrible diet, basically bread, onions, maybe a little bit of meat, and that they all would have died of nutritional deficiencies if not for the, the vitamins and nutrients provided by the beer that they were brewing at home. Um, the Mesopotamians also had a beer goddess. Uh, there's a hymn to Ninkasi, which um, two Germans have recently retranslated. And I find it hilarious and really charming because it, it sound, it's extremely technical. It's, it's like it was written by a brewer. Um, you know, e exactly what it sounds like, what order the ingredients are supposed to be put in. Um, they get a little bit poetic with the collector vat, but, you know, basically this is, this is a hymn to a goddess that brewers would have been very familiar with and relied on probably every day. Uh, ancient Egypt is also, uh, Classic example, um, I saw a fantastic hieroglyph Stella yesterday in the, in the Brewers um, headquarters. This is another great example. Also the type of beer, they, because they were fermenting in these huge pots, they used straws because they, they still had a lot of stuff floating. They tried to filter it out, but, um, and this guy is, fermenting and then they have these jars with loose caps so that the gases can still escape. And the Egyptians were doing this on an industrial scale to feed and fuel the workers building the pyramids. Um, they thought it was important enough to bury brewers symbolically with pharaohs and, and other important people in their graves so that they could take beer to the afterlife. Um, and this is this is the check cover. The checks decided to go double. Um, this this integral connection between people and beer is obviously something that we still have with us today. There's, it's been changed. You know, we we have the Reinheitsgebot in Germany that for 500 years has sort of limited what we think of as beer. Um, people in the past would have flavored their beer with anything you can imagine, including hallucinogens. Um, they would have mixed it. They would have added honey. They would have mixed it with wine. The Greeks and the Romans were very specific about beer being a barbarian drink. The Greeks and the Romans did not drink beer. Uh, but just about everywhere else where people were growing grain of any kind, people figured out some way to, to get it in the uh, fermenting vats and make it. This story really changed the way I think about alcohol and the, the relationship between drinking in moderation and not drinking in moderation. You remember we have this, in, there's this idea that we have this evolutionary impulse to seek out alcohol. There's a reason that it tastes good to us. And there's a reason that some of our ancestors and some of us would want to go too far. It's a, it's a craving that in the past would have been evolutionarily advantageous. Um, in the past, alcohol was a happy accident. You would find it, you know, fermenting fruit on the floor of the jungle. You would maybe be able to brew a few hundred liters for your whole tribe um, of something that if you were lucky, you would get to four or 5% in one of these vessels. Today's world, completely out of touch with that. You know, we, we brew in completely different quantities. We have ready access to spirits that are 10 times as alcoholic as what our ancestors would have been able to access. And that enables us to drink in a way that our ancestors couldn't have imagined. And I think this is related to how scientists are beginning to think about obesity as something that in the deep past would have been evolutionarily advantageous, the ability to maximize your calories and pack on fat. But for some people today, it's a disadvantage because of the 
way the modern world is out of sync with the past. Um, and I think thinking about that maybe gives us a different window into how we approach problem drinking today and also how we study the, the benefits of drinking in moderation. Uh, thank you guys for inviting me. Um, I, Patrick McGovern is not on here. He's, he's definitely somebody to look up. Um, and he has two fantastic books that are very accessible. Uh, one about wine and one about alcohol in general. Um, and Martin Zarnko, who was a guest here two or three years ago, also does a lot of fantastic work recreating the Mesopotamian beer culture. He, he let me taste some Mesopotamian beer that he brewed in his lab. Um, and post. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer.